Okay, so you, uh, I'll let you start your presentation. Oh, there it is. Just present, right? Okay, cool. No, I think I'm supposed to be in another room right now. Thank you, Brad. Oh, how absolutely. Will, how will this, uh, somebody else do the recording and turn things on? It's already it recording on? right now, so be careful what you say. Yeah. Did you turn it on? There's a little Scooby-Doo, um, a toggle on the top. It says off and on. Hello. Oh, Hello, my goodness. Live. You are live. Fabulous. Are live? Scary. No. Yeah, did you turn it on? Nope. It's a, that's a hole. Yeah, you got a That one's a hole. These are toggles. I, I think you're live. Okay. I'm live. Is this close She's enough? Live. You're live. Was this close enough? Live. I don't. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. Okay, you're live. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. When we get to the video, do you want to click on the video to make it? We are. Do you need to? Are you saving things for posterity? <laughs> Thank you. No getting out of my head. <laughs> it has been documented. It has been documented. It's like happening. Desperate times and all that. <laughs> Did it download? It's thinking. Yep, yeah, thinking. <laughs> oh yeah, it's about. Oh, uh, the <laughs> <original laughs> photos. Yeah. And this is when the laptop. That's the great specialty of working with me on slides. Is I guarantee it's going to be like 40 minutes. Oh. That's okay. I can. Oh yeah. Uh oh, well, that didn't show up. Should we go back? And that bleeds down. I can just scroll through. Can you just yeah. add the word troubleshooting on that other slide? In some cool font. Oh, this on Kat. You look at presented. It exemplifies culture and community. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Hi. We're just downloading it as a PowerPoint really quickly. Oh, yeah, I just, I'll just plug in the back of it. Alrighty. Alright. Present. Yes, it was off. I went through all of that. <laughs> so let's go back and see if it'll, it'll work in the drive now. Because that would be the ideal solution. Okay. It is. I am practicing. Yeah, all right. Sweet. I'm like, I thought we'd use the clicker before. Now so. it's not up there. Why is it not up there? 
Uh, what if you close the... There we go. Maybe. Mm, guess we'll go back to the PowerPoint. It's recording. <laughs> Troubleshooting is a life skill. <laughs> we're okay. Whoa. We were just trying to make it a PowerPoint really fast, and then we had. We're just going to go with this. Okay, we're ready now. Sweet. Totally ready. Cool. Over here? Oh, no. Not up here. We'll all be on different levels. <laughs> We're ready to go. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Feel Welcome. free to move up front if you'd like. My name is Amy Vecchione. I'm a librarian and professor at Boise State University Albertson's Library. And I'm Dina Brown. I'm also a librarian and a professor at Albertson's Library at Boise State University. And, and to model uh, our empowerment and inclusiveness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an undergraduate student at Boise State. <laughs> My major is psychology. This is my third year in college. So. And you have a <laughs> My name is Donovan. <laughs> You're more than just an undergraduate. So yes. <laughs> Donovan K. He's also on Twitter, uh, which is really exciting to me. It's really great to like, get to work with the students and engage with them offline as well, which we will talk a little bit about um, as we progress here. So we're going to talk about creating an inclusive and, and empowering makerspace. The most common thing that people like to focus on when they're working on makerspaces is what? The stuff. The, stuff, stuff. the technology. Right. Ooh, the what items, tools do you have? The laser cutters, <clears throat> the what have you. Uh, but we have found, in our experience, that it's actually a really amazing place for informal learning. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about is that that's critical to creating a makerspace, why that's critical, our experience doing so, and how as managers of these spaces we can work on attracting a really diverse group of people into the space and being inclusive as, as, we, want, as we can possibly be. Um, so we're going to share our strategies about how to be successful in designing these makerspaces, adapting to user needs, empowering them to work on the space and help foster a good positive environment. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to showcase a lot of collaborations. Yeah. All the successes that have happened. Donovan has one really great one he's been working on. Uh, so we'll get to that in a little bit. So these are the five main elements that we consider at this point to be what you want to include when you're working on a makerspace. This is not where we are at right now. I would consider that our library is at phase uh, zero and we're trying to move into phase one. We've done proof of concept and the most successful aspect to it, in our opinion, is the culture of happy collisions that we've developed and the student learning experiences that are really well crafted. And we have a lot of technical expertise, but we're trying to gain method methodology and individuals with more tech expertise because our students want to do so many things in a makerspace. We kind of hit a limit and a threshold of what we can support. We want to get more technical expertise, but we need a financial model to kind of grow and expand that and then develop connections with companies who can also help. So we've done a little bit about that. We'll talk more and we'll go back over these five elements. Uh, if you're working on making a makerspace, you need to have a great team. This is Dina and I and two students working at an innovation day. Uh, I think that's the most important part about all of this. This is our vision. Our makerspace is a radically inclusive community with a clear pipeline to fabrication resources that allows students to design ideas, objects, and ultimately their dreams. So now is the part where I need to ask you all why you're here. What is the status of makerspaces where you are? I'm assuming a lot of you are on college campuses. Is it a scattered effort? Is it a unified effort? Have you not yet begun talking about it? Or is it super advanced? Where do you guys fit? Who is scattered? Cool. Who is unified? Oh. Somebody's nodding. I see nodding. Maybe unified. Uh, who has not yet begun? Good, you're in the right place. And who <laughs> considers themselves an advanced makerspace presence? Awesome, okay. you're all in the right spot. Because uh, I would consider that where we're at right now is we have hit, like I said, phase zero. We've done proof of concept. We're ready to expand and keep growing. We've totally exceeded our space with people and ideas. We're ready to grow. So that's where we're at. And I hope you can learn a lot from what we're going to do. And then I want to know how you guys self-identify. 
So the choices are, I make things, I'm a maker. I was a maker before we called ourselves makers. I don't know if I make things or I don't make anything. You guys ready? Do you know where you fit on this scaffold here? Who makes things? Who's a maker? Yay, there's one maker. Two makers? Okay. Who was a maker before you considered yourselves makers? <laughs> that just yes. sounds kind of hipster. <laughs> so usually those folks are the <clears throat> measure twice, cut once people. They embrace a lot of the old shop philosophy and that's really important as well. We want to maintain all kinds of uh, philosophies like that. Who doesn't know if they make things? Not sure, which is okay. And who doesn't make anything at all? Okay, good, because you've probably all, you know, like, made yourself a meal or something, so. <laughs> I don't think that we have time to go to Jump or any ability for you guys to go over to Jump, but Jack's Urban Meeting Place is right down the street. If you have a chance to stop by there at all while you're visiting or any other time, they have five different maker spaces in that building, including a cooking space. So even if you cook, uh, at this point, that's kind of being considered a, being a part of a makerspace. Mm -hmm. If you guys have the time or the chance to check out Jump, you should. I would recommend it. All right, so the first focus is the, the culture. Um, we try to reach out and partner with specific groups. We partner with like-minded individuals and craft this great team to deliver and design these crafted learning experiences. We really stress informal learning in these spaces that it's a risk-free environment. So students can come in and experiment. They're not going to be worried about whether or not they're going to get an A or whatever in the class. They can take their own personal projects, explore how to make them and create them. And that's, that's the risk-free element. Uh, if something breaks, we don't care who broke it, right? I don't think we do anyway. No. Uh, we had a nice break this week, which presents a great story. Last week <laughs> on Friday, we, we discovered one of our 3D printers was broken. Uh, the bed had cracked. As I was about to start a training session on it, I turned and saw, oh, it's cracked and it won't turn on and it won't heat, which prevents us from moving forward completely. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't fix that on the fly. And so, you know, it doesn't matter who broke it. We just called, got one ordered, got it back in. It was working yesterday. So that's the kind of focus that we have. It doesn't matter who broke it. Maybe it matters why it broke, so we can prevent that again in the future, but I don't care who broke it. And I try really hard not, I try to model that for everybody in the space. And kind of along with that situation was one of the other students actually asked, so what are we doing with the old build plate? Can we make a new printer with it? <laughs> so it's a it kind of, the, the risk is allowed and built upon, so. I think they were even joking about trying to turn it into a way to heat pizza. Oh, we're yes. gonna try to repair yes. the actual build plate, which tr gets pretty hot, it gets too, I don't know how hot those get, but it's 110 degrees, or no, 120 degrees Celsius. Celsius is the maximum. That's right, you investigated yeah. that. I remember I now. Yeah, I put bacon on it. <laughs> so that's part of the goal is to work. try to empower everybody that's in the space to become their energized. They can take ownership of the space. They can grab whatever they want that's being left behind, maybe even thrown away, and they can make things with that technology. And then we try to move everybody up on the levels of engagement. I don't talk too much about them to the students. They don't know that there are levels of engagement, but I'm going to share some of those with you. Um, but something that I've had an aha moment about is that makerspaces are hubs for design thinking, uh, which I'm, we're going to mention a little bit more about. So they're not necessarily a space about technology. They're a place where people rapidly prototype and iterate their ideas. Let me give them a chance to take a photo. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to talk about the inclusive nature and the partnerships. You want to talk a little bit about this, Dina, sure. with LSAMP and TRIO? Yeah, for sure. So uh, one of, on the, one of the previous slides, we were talking about some of the partnerships and groups that we've specifically reached out to. So we did want to make sure that um, anyone that came into this space could see themselves in it. And there's a couple of ways that we've gone about doing that. One of, it, one of the ways is we've gone about um, inviting specific groups on campus into the space. Um, and some of these groups uh, include uh, the, um, the Women Technology Group that's on campus. The acronym is completely... ACMW, ACMW. Association of Computing Machinery, Machinery Women. Thank ACMW. you. Um, we've invited them in. We've invited um, TRIO students in and Upward Bound students. So those are um, students who are first time uh, college students and their family. So this can also be a great opportunity to 
kind of show people that maybe are um, intimidated about the idea of going to college that there's a place for them where they can kind of have fun and maybe network with other friends um, and uh, <clears throat> have a space to work on some personal projects so it doesn't have to all be about what's going on in class. Um, so when we invite these different groups into the space, one of the things that we do is we make sure that, um, that we take a picture of them. And I think we'll talk about this a little bit in a second, but there's a monitor where um, we can upload the images that we've taken. And so they literally can see themselves in the space. Or if their friends come back in the space later, they can see a picture of them on the wall. So even if they aren't physically in the space at the moment, there's a, some sort of a residual <laughs> record of the fact that they were in there and that they were engaging with the space. And I think that that helps a lot to make them have that sense of ownership of the space. So this has not only um, helped us connect with other departments across campus, but a lot of these students that have actually become advocates for the space have gone and talked to their friends. A lot of the um, excitement around the space has been word of mouth. Um, we've even got a student um, who came in from one of these groups who's recently got a job because of the access to technology that he has had in the Maker Lab. It's, this is the Lewis Stokes <coughs> Alliance for Minority Participation. They're a STEM group that's on campus that's funded and so they, we brought them in. A lot of the reason we reach out to these specific programs is because we want to go for a bigger impact. People who are already feeling empowered are going to be in the space and they'll learn a little bit, but people who have not previously felt empowered by technology have a lot more to gain. Uh, we're also starting to partner with school groups that are local and we're getting requests to travel around the state of Idaho to visit schools, uh, which we don't have the resources to do right now. We've, we're just doing this as a pilot project. But this is a group of students that came, it's about 60 students from a fifth and sixth grade classroom and they all were screaming, I want to go to Boise State when they left. And they were jumping up and down in the amphitheater. They just loved the experience that we had set up for them. We do these really well-crafted instruction sessions that are a combination of constructivism and team-based active learning, where they're creating teams and then investigating, doing a deep dive with one type of technology, such as Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, 3D design, things like that, uh, emerging technologies. They learn it together, and they learn to rely on each other in that space, and then they've learned a lot. Um, we try not to position ourselves as the experts, but rather these students as the experts. So it's also a recruitment tool, as well as an empowerment tool. Okay, so this is my really ridiculous graph of what we're trying to do, and I'll show you the design thinking version of this, but over time, uh, there's technical expertise. We don't care where they come in at. We don't care if they have a lot. We're going to train them and we're going to just move them up and it's going to look a little crazy. It's actually going to look more like this. This is the squiggle. Has anyone ever heard of the squiggle in design thinking before? So in design thinking, when you're iterating and prototyping and learning, it's going to look super messy. It's going to look like this. And eventually, uh, you're going to have clarity and focus and you're going to have some greater output. That output may be a video, maybe a podcast, a 3D design. It could be a, a web app. So what we see in the makerspace is this mess. And I feel very comfortable in this mess, but that is not necessarily something that a lot of people feel comfortable in. So it's more like being in touch with your design thinking process and your learning process. And if you can be in touch with that, that can help move the students along a great deal. Uh, I think this is the early stages of design. The squiggle is a place where the more input and the more research you get, the better the output and the solution is gonna be that emerges from that. So that's part of that aha moment that these makerspaces are hubs for design thinking. They're not a place to put a whole bunch of de technology. It's not a place to stick a drill press and then see what happens. It's a place to get messy with your thought process and design. Mm -hmm. Here's our engagement profile that we have. Donovan, I don't remember how you even came to the Maker Lab, but at some point you had downloaded a file from Thingiverse, yeah. and that would have been considered to be the intro level. Mm -hmm. You expressed interest and you joined the community, correct? So that would yeah. have been the introductory level. That's generally how most people discover our Maker Lab at Boise State. And then you get to level two, more or less, by modifying a print in Tinkercad, and you tinker yourself in a workshop. At level three, you've started on a project, you've met with the librarians in the space or the technologists, whoever are in that space. You become a part of the after hours program, which is kind of a holdover title. It's what we call the super users in the space. 
who start taking on ownership over the space, making modifications to the equipment, making modifications to the space. Level five, they've become a member of the club that we supervise, and they've engaged in critical reflection of their projects, prototyping and troubleshooting them. And that's so important. Once you start seeing them make those aha moments of, oh, I know why that didn't work. That didn't work because blah happened. Uh, then they can start actually working and volunteering in the ma Maker Lab. So last night I was on the phone doing FaceTime troubleshooting with a student because they couldn't figure it out on themselves on their own. And it turns out that the machine needs, we have to troubleshoot more yeah. with a multimeter but haven't gotten there yet. And then at some point they become an expert offering workshops on 3D design and training others. So that's where Donovan has hit. Little did you know you were on this timeline. We've planned out for you. You will hit expert level. Um, and so the, the, um, the levels here are kind of specific to 3D printing, but those do definitely translate to any of the other technology that's available in the space. Um, that's just the example we were using. <clears throat> oh, it didn't show up. <laughs> Troubleshooting, Troubleshooting is a life skill. Sorry, I edited this a couple times. As is exemplified by the slide, <laughs> it didn't show up the way we thought it was going to. I <laughs> did edit this right before we started to make it show up, and then it went away again. So we liked it. That's our phrase, one of our phrases. <laughs> An interpretive dance about troubleshooting. <laughs> troubleshooting. It's a life skill. Yeah. Uh, we also like to think that this is addressing the technical skill gap that appears in the workforce because they're getting an act, uh, they're acquiring all of these technical skills. They think they're just coming in to 3D print something and that's really exciting. That's like, you know, the most exciting thing anyone wants to do. They want to 3D print some object and then show it to all their friends, but then they accidentally learn a tremendous amount of skills in the space all the digital fluency and literacy skills that they need, which will help them get jobs like some of our students. So we have one student who got a position specifically because of working in the makerspace and another one for 3D design and printing at HP. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple little short vignettes that we have about that that have really benefited. You're gonna talk about the pilot project. You wanna talk about this part? Yeah, sure. So, um, so one of the things that we have done is we've kind of shifted the way that our 3D printing process has happened over time. It started off as a completely mitigated process. Um, it was taking up about 80 hours um, per week of our unit's time. There are only three full-time staff members that work in our unit, so that was a significant impact on our ability to do other things. Um, and also, students weren't learning a whole lot in that process. So we wanted to make sure that, um, thinking back to those levels of engagement, that we could kind of help push students up. So what we did is we've shifted now to what Amy uh, was talking about a second ago, the after hours program, which is where um, students actually are running the prints themselves. So what we did is um, we kind of helped them work on their prototype if they need some um, kind of troubleshooting on maybe the best way to print it. Um, and then what we do is we have them go through a one hour training where they can print anytime the library is open and if the calendar is free. So they can go in and sign up for a time, uh, they can bring in their file and then it's completely up to them to run the print and um, make sure that they've got their settings dialed in and kind of keep an eye on it while it's going. Um, this helped us tremendously in our unit as far as how much time um, we were having to spend on providing the 3D printing service. But it's also been, for me, the thing that's been most exciting about it is seeing um, students really feeling empowered to come in and engage with the technology in a very different way than they were when um, they were simply uploading a file and we were printing it and then they were picking it up at the front desk. They have a whole other level of excitement about this now. They're bringing their friends in while their prints are going and sitting there and showing them and talking to them about it. Um, I've had students come in and bring friends who don't go to school at Boise State and say, hey, you should totally come to school here because look at this cool stuff we get to do. Um, and so what that's doing is that's helping a student feel um, more confident in the space. There's a certain amount of personal confidence that you gain when you actually make something. Um, so there's a much more, um, much more buy-in and uh, <coughs> excuse me, connection that they have with their finished product if they've actually done it themselves. Um, and like we were saying, there are definitely an, um, at least a couple students that we've heard of uh, that have actually gained jobs because they've had this hands-on experience with the technology um, that they're able to directly relate um, to the job that they're applying for. Donovan, can you talk a little bit about what that actually looks like for you guys yeah. when you're in the space? Can you describe how you all work together? Yeah, so basically like 
most of it's the troubleshooting aspect is whenever something goes wrong, there's usually people sitting in there just doing homework, playing around on their computer, and those people have been there so long that they've seen plenty of failures. So as soon as you see something that goes wrong, you just turn and like 10 feet away, there's someone who's had that exact same problem who can step up and say, this is what you can do to fix it, or this is how I know that you can't fix it, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And then when you guys run overtime or undertime, you all communicate about that as well using the calendars mm -hmm. too? Yeah, so we're really open about communication where sometimes, like for instance, the bigger 3D printer, it, when it gives us a time estimate, it, it's not very accurate. We usually have to add time and a half to that. And even that is kind of just a benchmark. So we have to be able to tell the person who's printing after us that maybe we'll go a little over. Maybe we can start your print for you so you don't have to come in. That kind of thing all happens pretty easily where we communicate with each other and can start each other's prints, take, take each other's prints off the bed, that kind of thing. And so none of that would have happened if we had continued with the mitigated model that we were working with. So um, I really feel like that shift has been kind of what has made this community really blossom in a way that um, it didn't look like it was maybe going to before. Which leads us into the part where we're creating connections. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how in touch you all feel with students on your campuses, but the way this kind of started was there was a 3D printer in my office before we even started the makerspace, which, so technology has something to do with this, yes? Right, it does. I'm gonna admit that openly. There was a 3D printer in our space, and the, this group of intrepid students literally knocked on my door and said, hey, you have a 3D printer in your office. What is it doing there? What can we do to help you with that? Mm -hmm. uh, um, actually, the student in the black shirt, all the way at the back with the red lettering, his name is Greg Broger. Mm -hmm. He's the one who was the, literally the first one to knock on the door and ask for that kind of assistance. And a lot of these students still spend a lot of time in the Maker Lab. Mm -hmm. Some of them have graduated and moved on. Uh, but this, we just let them in. And that's what it can start to look like. You just let them in, you let the students in, and you start working with them on the projects they have. The really important thing in the culture here to really make it persevere has been starting a Slack channel. Who uses Slack? Slack. Do you use Slack? Do you love Slack? It's pretty Who great. smiles? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I would do without Slack. We have a private channel that's just for the team that works in the space. And then every time a student enters the space that wants to become a part of the community, they get added to the Slack channel. It's, it's so important here. I don't know that you can see the fine print but they're trying to vote on the name of the new 3D printer that they acquired. So the students took on the initiative to request funding from the student government at Boise State. They received that funding and they purchased their own 3D printer that they could manhandle essentially however they wanted to, which is great. It, um, it's being named CATS, which, sti which is spelled C-T-A-Z, which is the Creative Technologies Association, but with a Z at the end. And uh, there's a lot of inside jokes that kind of developed out of this, including a czar cat. This is a long story, but Slack <laughs> helps to reinforce those inside <laughs> jokes. And that continues to help develop the culture in the space, is that it's almost like a long-winded Arrested Development joke that you started in season one, and then it's season three, and you kind of uh -huh. can't believe that's still funny. That's sort of how I feel about the Slack channel and the culture that's developed. Uh, so the czar cats and the cats, now there's dogs, because we're talking about diversity and inclusion all the time in the makerspace, so they're trying to be inclusive in printing other animals besides <laughs> cats, which is fairly hilarious. And then there's some emeriti faculty that have started spending a lot of time there. They just love being there and welcoming them. Mm -hmm. And I've spent a lot of time training them not to over-teach. There's this obvious part where, as a faculty member, you want to teach all the right ways to do something, but we like to give everyone just enough space to make the mistakes on their own and allow this mentorship to happen. So one of our emeriti faculty, John Biglow, has been printing trilobites. They're all over the makerspace, and it's just become another one of the inside jokes that helps reinforce the culture. This has nothing to do with me or Dina. Uh, we don't care about 3D printed cats or trilobites. I mean, um, I care very deeply, but... but you <laughs> If you find the tr this big trilobite, you have to hide it again, and then everybody else is trying to find the trilobite. That's and maybe, maybe take a picture of where you found it, and then hide it again and say, all right, it's hidden again, guys. Do you want to speak to this part, Donna? I haven't really seen that much. <laughs> I've only seen it found once, and then everyone was just kind of playing with it for a bit. And so I don't, 
I, I guess I missed that joke. I okay. Think I came in a bit you late. came in after the trilobite. <laughs> so now you know the history. Yeah. Okay. The general slogan about this is let's let them. So let's listen to everybody's ideas that comes into the space, make improvements based on what they're suggesting, ask them for their input when we're making a change, let the students take the lead or the faculty members that are spending time in the space, let them train others, empower them to make changes, and in each workshop, empower the users to just get started. Mm -hmm. And as Dina mentioned, we have this positive feedback loop that we have developed, which is a rotation of photos of people who are spending time in the space with the Raspberry Pi, which is in the ceiling connecting to an Apple TV. This is a faculty member named Sam Matson in Geosciences, one of his students and another student getting trained, and they're using this in their classes. Um, so this rotation is really crucial. This is that Amer one of the emeriti, this is the one who printed the trilobite the first time, and this is another student whose project we'll show you in a, in a bit. Sometimes when prints go awry, we like to take them and figure out what to do with them. In this case, this is Boise State University anagrammed over and over and over again a million times. <laughs> Sensitive toy bat user, but the real favorite one is use toasts be ritzy. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the first one that came about and that's sort of a weird random slogan that exists in the space. And there it is with the trilobite. Vote tub inset Irie Sassy. I don't even know what that means. So we consider ourselves to be the sortitators uh, we're not facilitators. That's maybe a reference to potatoes in Idaho. Um, but we're the sort of facilitators of the space. It's really not our space. We're just there to help everybody else spend time there. Mm -hmm. and one of our student employees, Amanda, works, we have two student employees, works in the space, and we have our personas up on the wall so that everybody knows what we specialize in. So they can come bug us if they need help in something. And then the students that work in the space have developed some of their personas as well. So that we're all it could be done digitally, but we're doing it with paper on a wall. And I think this is really important because the space isn't always necessarily staffed. And so that way, if people do come into the space and there isn't necessarily someone sitting right there waiting to help them, they at least have somewhere that they can turn and put a face to a name and kind of see a list of things that we can assist them with and then they can seek us out. Um, I've had people come in that um, you know, they, they were hanging out in the space and I walk up and start talking to them and like halfway through the conversation they kind of turn and they're like, oh wait. And like the light goes off that they understand what all those pictures are on the wall. You work here, <laughs> right. you can help me. But it's, it's also really helpful when ever someone comes into the space and they're trying to get in contact with Dina or Amy, we can just say, you see that face up there when you see that face, <laughs> that's who you're talking to. <laughs> so it's really helpful for that as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> It's final projects time. So now you get to see what Woo! kind of the outcome looks like. Yeah. You're gonna take it away? I'll do it, let's do it. So, this one's pretty cool. Anyone would take a guess at what this is? Looks like it's what? A sponge. A sponge, okay. Anyone else? Huh? Phosphorescence? A virus. A vi Ooh, you're close. You're close. Hmm? Plastic <laughs> Oh my gosh, you got it. <laughs> Um, they do look like plastic pom-poms, uh, but they're, um, the little turquoise blue part is a drug that a chemistry faculty um, wanted to get a visual representation of, and so that little blue part actually comes out, and uh, they were using this as a manipulative in their class to kind of show how the drug interacts with the, is it a... He invented the drug. He invented the drug. And it's okay. on a protein, human carbonyl reductase. <clears throat> and he'd never been able to afford the model of this right. before. Dr. Charlier. So if anyone ever tells you that 3D printing <laughs> is just for 3D printing tchotchkes, um, you, you can tell them that it isn't. There are definitely some like definite instructional value in having this technology available. This one's one of my favorites. Um, so this is um, a class of happy material science students who um, they all developed, um, those are all crystal models that they're holding, and they developed them in a, um, a crystal maker, I think was the name of the program. And we worked with this faculty member who actually just presented about this um, last week. And so what he did is they all made them in Crystal Maker and then uh, we 3D printed them for them. For that particular project, we went ahead and did that for them. Um, that way they weren't having to each come in and individually get trained and find the time to print it. Crystals but, are hard to print. Yeah, they are. There was, some, there was some tricky manipulation that we had to do as far as slicing them in a way that they would print successfully. Um, 
which wasn't the point of the exercise for the class. The great thing about that project, though, is, and that the um, faculty member shared with us, is that in, um, at the end of that project, he did a survey with the students, and the response that he got was overwhelmingly positive. A number of them said that they had a whole new understanding of how crystalline structures work, because they were able to actually hold it in their hand in a way that they never would have understood just looking at it on a screen. So I think that was a resounding success for us on that one. Ooh, well, that's I'll good. That one. This is great. So, um, so this is a centrophone. Has anyone this kind of made the rounds online? Awesome video, guy snowboarding, skiing. Okay. Um, Oops, <clears throat> so this is a project that a student 3D printed a housing for their um, cell phone, have it on the end of a tether, and uh, because of the frame rate on the iPhone versus like on a GoPro. Um, we're able to capture this really awesome video that hopefully we will show you here in a second. No, it's not working. Oh, how do I make it work? How do I switch? Were you not able to get a video going either? Is that what I heard? You have to turn off the multi-screen. Oh. Let me close this. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm looking for the right place to do that. So how many of you guys have 3D printing at your school? Okay. How many of you, is it in um, some sort of science building? No? Where is it? <laughs> okay. It's in a basement. No one goes down there. Okay. Okay. But it's, is it an open space? Anyone can go to it. Okay, so here's the video. I'll hit play one more time. So this is... It's a 3D printed object that he designed with a tether, put his phone in it, hit record, and then the frame rate matches up so that it appears to be slow motion. So he's actually swinging this wildly. Really fast, yeah. I find that to be just super impressive. Yay, super somebody's fun. mind was blown today by that. You guys want to see, <laughs> yeah. see one more time? Because I love it. I could watch this all day. It's a pretty fun one. And look how happy he is with yeah, this. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It turned out great. This is the Bruneau sand dunes, mm -hmm. which are about an hour and a half southeast of here. Yeah. If you do a search for a centrophone, you'll find some other videos of someone skiing using the same sort of setup that are pretty amazing. Um, we don't, but we could probably bring one up in a second. Have we used these, Donovan? No. Okay. So these are, uh, so Amy made reference to um, us doing some stuff at Jump. So we, um, the Creative Technologies Association, which is the club that we're faculty advisors to, were invited to go to Jump for Innovation Day um, and kind of help fill up the space a little bit and have some other activities going on um, aside from just the student projects that were on display. So uh, our, the club took the initiative to design these fabulous um, game control panels um, that were made by going up and down the aisles of, I think, Lowe's one weekend and just kind of gathering materials. And um, they're hooked up, you can't see, but they're hooked up on a big screen. There's a tank game, and so you can, you can blow up your friends on either side. Um, so this was a great outreach tool. The kids that came into the space were having a blast. I, even the adults were having a blast playing this. Um, and there was something kind of magical about it that they walked into the space and didn't really know what would be going on um, and were greeted with this you know, super fun thing to be doing that they probably all went back and told their friends about. Um, so very um, awesome tool that they came up with that they designed on their own. They fabricated on their own. There was definitely some troubleshooting that went on with that. Um, they, of course, already have ideas of version 2.0 um, and things that they can do moving forward to not only improve the game controller itself, but different games that they might hook it up to and what that would look like. <clears throat> This has been one of the most popular um, types of things that people print. Anyone want to take a guess what this is? Yeah. Sound, yes. 
Right, how many of you guys have done the trick where you put your cell phone in a cup to amplify it? Okay, yeah, doing the dishes, do that all the time. Uh, I, I should probably 3D print one of these myself. So you hook it up to your phone and what it does is it basically acts as a speaker. So this is, I feel like, a, one of those aha moments that a lot of people have of figuring out where there is that real world application for this, of that it isn't just plastic tchotchkes. Oh wait, I can actually print something that's gonna improve my life. This is a crazy awesome project. So everyone knew who this is? Do you or know the, how this is going, Donovan? Or the beginning of? Can you I know a little bit about it. Tell us about BB-8. So one of the guys, uh, he started, you know, he, he's 3D printed all the individual pieces for BB-8, put them together and painted them, and he's actually developing the robotic components of the internal ball. So eventually this thing's going to be a fully functioning robot that he's designed basically from scratch. With a servo motor yep. attached to it. And they're doing this, I should say, this is nothing to do with their classwork. Nope. This is completely their passions that we're just here to help sort of tape. Mm -hmm. right? so. <laughs> um, so here is hooking up the, um, the game board to an Arduino. Uh, in the other picture, it was hooked up to a bunch of Makey Makeys, so they're also playing around with different configurations of resources that they have available to them in the lab. This is a great photo. Um, so we um, put out uh, an announcement about the workshops that we had going on, and we were getting a lot of um, questions from librarians um, in the Idaho library community asking if they could come to our workshops. Um, which of course we're like, yeah, join us. Um, we had a lot of interest in our Arduino workshop. And so what we ended up doing is um, putting together a one-off for just librarians across the state. We had people drive all the way from Eastern Idaho to come and attend this, to attend a one-hour workshop to tinker with Arduinos and kind of learn the basic in and outs of them. And that's because this technology isn't just happening in our library, it's happening in libraries across the state. Um, and uh, we, I mean, uh, people from the state have gone to the White House to talk about <laughs> how maker technology is kind of sweeping across libraries in Idaho. A student <laughs> led the workshop. Yeah. It was not us leading the workshop. We were just being sort of taters. Oh, we should have brought these. Oh, I didn't about that. Right now. But if so, any of you are going to be around for First Thursday tomorrow, mm -hmm. one of the First Thursday events is at Trailhead, which is about a block away. Our students are going to be there with a lot of the things they've designed and developed, so you can, including Donovan. There's going to be a mini maker fair, excuse me, maker showcase. Maker showcase. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a ghost, and the eyeballs in the upper left were 3D printed. They kind of, they're tracking eyes, so they can go back and forth and up and down a little bit. They were painted, and uh, they were inserted into these puppets that um, were used for a play. The play was about ghosts that work in a call center that communicate with a Ouija board. <laughs> that was a student design. <laughs> So as a theater, theater applications abound. You never know where this creativity will go. I know. And Donovan, I want you to talk about yeah. this, but also the major project that you've been working on in this space. So this is actually a pretty cool thing. Someone has designed an entire uh, tabletop game where you 3D print all the components, and then you launch pennies at each other's <laughs> little castles. So you 3D print all these little bricks, and you put them together, and you have three flags that you put on somewhere on your structure. You put them at opposite ends of a table, and you have penny catapults that you launch at each other. Whoever wins, whoever knocks all three of the other team's flags off first wins. It's this whole, all of the designs are open access. They're on Thingiverse, which is a digital database of 3D models. So this was the first one that I tried printing. It kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit? I don't have the. So I can actually bring it up on Thingy okay, first so really that, quickly. The way we met Donovan was his teacher mm -hmm. in psychology, where he's a TA, came in and wanted to work on accessibility prints for visually impaired students in the classroom. And they're working on psychology statistics. And Donovan's actually the TA for that class. Uh, you can find the designs he's worked on to try to make it accessible. I believe their first iteration, is it okay if I speak for you a little bit yeah. here? Was a Lego a Lego iteration where they were trying to share and explain statistical analysis to visually impaired students using a Lego model. 
So here's the model that I started with. The, uh, this concept is called the normal distribution of st statistics. So the idea is that in any given population, the more, um, the more uh, responses you get to that, the closer they'll approximate this normal distribution. So there will be a lot of scores right clustered together, and it'll taper off as you get further extreme from the average. So this is, it's absolutely essential to learning statistics, and it's always taught with a graph. And we had a blind student in our class, and at one point, he, my professor, Dr. Stone, he was like, I don't know how to teach this to a blind student. So we started off with models of Legos, where we would make the graphs with Legos. We used push pins and made the, approximated this with, you know, so that you could feel along the, a cork board. And then I, I had the idea, why don't we just make a 3D model of it? And uh, I, had, I, had, I knew the Maker Lab existed previously, but I, I didn't know the full extent of it. So Dr. Stone got me in touch with Amy. She said, I'll print this first one for you. You can come and pick it up. And it was really cool, because then I got to watch it be printed, because we have webcams set up by the printers, so you can watch as, it, as it's being printed. And it was really cool. But the first one kind of turned out bad, honestly. <laughs> um, there were, there were little artifacts near the bottom where it started peeling off the bed. The corners rose up because it wasn't adhering to the bed. So over time, I was able to make multiple iterations of the model, and this is the kind of culmination. So I went from raised bars up to furrowing a channel through the middle. So this is the current version of it. And I'm trying to think of other ways to make it better, make it more interactive so that it can be applicable not only to someone learning it that can't see it, but to someone that can see it as well. Thanks, Donovan. Cool, yeah. thanks. And have you gotten feedback that having that tool has helped? Yes, them? we've okay. gotten very good feedback that it's, she said, she said that she could actually imagine the model. Because when you talk about what a curve looks like, you can imagine infinite number of curves, but this is a, a, a particular type of curve that you need to be able to see. Well, feel, I guess, in this instance. Right. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with maker spaces, the model that we choose to like the most here for our space is the one from Georgia Tech, the Invention Studio. This is just a quick survey they did where the N was 50 of alumni who had used the space, uh, depicting what they liked the most about it. And you can see everything is, it's a range from one to five, where five is, yes, I identify that that was instrumental in my learning. And one is, not at all, it wasn't instrumental in my learning while I was at Georgia Tech. Um, so if you can, and you're interested and passionate, I would search for this white paper about what they did there, because their student empowerment is on a whole other level. They, if they're gonna use a lathe, they first are going to pour the metal to create the lathe. They don't mess around at Georgia Tech, so I really appreciate <laughs> that. And I feel like that's the kind of model that I'd like to embrace. Uh, they have a life cycle for all of their 3D printers is about a month. Each 3D printer gets designed for the user group that they are working with. So it's a STEAM cohort. Artists are also working on designing the 3D printers, and they design it with the user elements in mind. So if we had a 3D printer just for psychology and just for uh, accessibility, they would work with that user group and they would create art on the 3D printer to make it really impressive and beautiful so people could readily identify it. But then they take them down and rebuild them every month. Um, anyway, so some, just some key things here. Providing students with free access to hands-on, state-of-the-art prototyping technologies hit 4.69 out of 5 as instrumental in their success while they were undergrads at Georgia Tech. I'm just going to breathe, breathe through that really fast. So just to come back to this, as we move forward, it's not about the technology. It's the student learning experiences are being well-crafted. It's about this culture of happy collisions. It's reinforcing the kind of culture that people are creating in this space. We have to have a better financial model. We need more connections with companies. There's one uh, group in town called the Boise Virtual Reality uh, Company. They've been coming in working with our students directly since that's not an area of expertise that we have. So we're trying to fill the technical expertise gap with the companies. The companies who are working with the students in the space are finding that this is a great way for them to help groom students to hire when they graduate. 
So it's really kind of amazing what has happened in this space. This is absolutely not what we expected to find. Uh, we were all kind of thrown into this. Um, but this is what we have learned. We'll be publishing on our results. We don't have a lot of survey data yet to share, but we really wanted to just start getting this out there. I think we're ready to take some questions from you guys. If you have any. Yes. So that was something that Amy mentioned. So we did have one of our printers actually the so the bed got cracked the other day and um, and so what we stress is um, an open line of communication and we don't actually care who it. it Ultimately, it doesn't really matter who broke it. It just matters that it's broken, and then it needs to be fixed so that other people can use it. So no, we don't charge anyone. And actually, pr printing is free, um, because we wanted to make sure that the cost was not a barrier to people to um, gain some experience with that technology. So what is your material cost? It's about $1.67 per print on the 3D printer. It's less than $5,000 per year, mm -hmm. which is nothing, right? Yeah. to create these amazing successes. Yeah. Can you say a little bit you know, about how you got some of your other devices? Like yeah, contests? for sure. So, um, so how many of you guys have a maker space or are wanting to get a maker space? OK. So, um, so as Amy alluded to, our space started with, here's a 3D printer. <laughs> do something with it. Um, and so we've just kind of cobbled between having that bequeathed to us and uh, pulling resources. So a lot of the audio video stuff that we had hanging around. And then you guys also all create videos, right? I'm sure a lot of you've created videos. videos we yeah. just took that stuff and said, let's check it out. Right. We're going to use it too. But, but let's let everyone let the students use it also. Right. Nobody is deliberately breaking this stuff. Right. So yeah. Lighting and whatnot. But uh, so the other uh, piece of technology that we've got, so one of the 3D printers we have, we got through um, a grant slash competition that I applied for, a couple of them. Uh, so the vinyl cutters and the makey makeys that we have, those we got through Instructables. Everyone familiar with Instructables? Through the build nights that they used to do. They're only doing the contests now. They don't do the build nights anymore, which is kind of a bummer. But so um, we've also done this with like virtually no official budget. So. Um, we were also getting kind of creative in how we were going to be able to kind of grow some of the resources that were available to people. So Dina wrote a lot Leslie. of grants to get that equipment, yeah. essentially. <coughs> a lot of the stuff that's in there mm -hmm. came through that. So you mentioned that you have Perdue and Wake Makey. Do you mm -hmm. have plans to expand those sort of tools with uh, places you can actually make a certain We have a soldering station now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I haven't talked much about that because it's brand new. We have two, actually. Two, you can check one out of the library and you can use one inside the space. Mm -hmm. We whole, only want lead-free solder to be used in the space. But the students have mostly found that they're using the variable temperature soldering station to kind of sew together 3D prints. So if you cut a 3D object into four pieces, you, we would normally glue it all together. And they're actually setting the temp to 240 and then gluing their prints together like that, which is fascinating. I know. But, so they yes, also are soldering. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. It's a really nice, happy collision of stuff yeah. that's going on in there. Um, but yes, I'm hoping I'm taking sabbatical in the fall to learn a better financial model so that we can have these kinds of resources. And that really depends on who we partner with. Going and so our reaction to students using a soldering iron for something that we had not initially thought it was going to be used for wasn't to say, oh, guys, we have to take the soldering iron away. It's for solder, now it's broken. not for plastic. It won't work now for soldering, darn right. it. Right. It, it's, it's true. It won't now. Yeah. <laughs> but, but instead, what we did is we bought another set of tips. And we're like, all right, guys, that's the tips. How much for are the tips? The, like five bucks right. or something. Yeah. Easy. Right. We just do, that's just how we do things. Right. That's just how it goes. So there's also the how that right. we're yes. trying to develop. So we have right. this old circuit box thing. It's like, yo, why? You know, it's this old thing from Micron that they were going to throw away. Some of the guys from the CTA were like, we're going to take this apart and use the components if they're useful or just have fun taking things apart because that's fun. <laughs> and then we had this idea of making it into what we call the haptic, I don't remember, it's supposed to be so that we throw a whole bunch of components in there and anyone can walk in and have, you know, uh, visual, you know, some, some 
you push a button and it says something. You, it's a lot you of know. the difference between Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. There's yeah. going to be multitudes of both in the whole object. So when you push things, you'll be like, oh, that's what an Arduino does. Yeah. Because most people are like, I don't know what an Arduino does. <laughs> that's, that's kind of where I am. That's why I'm not very good at speaking about it. But <laughs> it's, it sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the, the barrier that I find is that it's hard to convince administrators of how uh, important that could be because we can't necessarily secure everything and have somebody watching it. We have to have cameras, and so the three D printers that I have are locked in my office oh. because, right? Because of this. Yeah. So is that something that you've experienced? And, and because in my mind. That's a precious resource to the students. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's my impression that they're going to treat those things that are, oh, they are expen an expensive piece of equipment, but the students are going to treat it with care right. because they want to be able to use it. But convincing administrators of that is not. Oh, that's the hardest door, thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the hardest the door. door. How, how, do you, how did you get through that? Oh, gosh. So, so you continue to get Continue. Yeah, it's an continue. Process. But but I can give you maybe a couple tips that I feel like worked for us um, because definitely when we started doing this, there was definitely a lot of pushback, um, uh, people, and I think part of it was out of fear and just not understanding, you know, why why is this happening here? Um, and so one of the things that we did is as we um, have been kind of moving through this process, we've done our best to communicate back to the staff within our building of what's going on, what's you know working, what's not, whether that's like at an all staff meeting, we do a quick presentation of like, hey, here's where we're at, here's what's going on. That's giving them some talking points that they can go back and if people do ask them questions, they can feel empowered to actually kind of answer them. Um, and uh, it also kind of you know keeps us on point of feeling like we need to report back to our colleagues. I would also though, the idea of the 3D printer in your office locked away where no one can get to it, and if the hang-up of administration is that too many you know, hands are going to be touching it and something's going to break, you could try doing something where maybe periodically you kind of roll it out and someone hangs out like in the entrance of your building with it. And uh, we've, been, we've been doing something called pop-up programs where literally what we do is we just take one of these pieces of technology, have it sitting on a table, and have someone hang out with it for an hour. and like invite, you know, kind of like trip people as they're coming in the library and like, hey, you want to check out this thing I've got? And, you know, sure, not ever, you know, some people are like, no, I'm late for a class. And then other people are like, whoa, what is that? And come over and it's kind of like this surprise and delight that they've gotten when they walk into the building. So that might be a way to kind of like show proof of concept, no, this is an important experience for people to have. But the real lever <coughs> was taking a small risk Mm -hmm. and saying, I'm going to let them, and it started in a micro way. It was in my office, and the students were knocking on my door saying, I want to use that. And I said, okay, I have eight meetings to go to because it's Monday, right? That's a normal Monday. <laughs> um, so I would say, oh, there's these students that are really excited about using this, so I'm just going to leave them in my office. It's unlocked. I trust them. They're making this amazing thing. Okay, so that was one thing. And then we were growing that. OK, there's actually 10 students in my office right now. And they're all <laughs> using the 3D printer. And they're all waiting. So that's how it started. Well, and can I just point out that um, when Amy's first 3D printer, Amy had in her office, was very, very temperamental. In fact, people began calling Amy's boyfriend. And so I think when you say that having the students there actually helped you troubleshoot it an awful lot, Yes. Too? Yes, I wouldn't be anywhere where I am without these volunteer students that are super passionate about what they do. Absolutely. Yeah. We would not have a space. We would not have any kind of uh, administrative buy-in at all without the fact that we partnered directly with them and said, we're going to do this. That's why the empowerment is so huge. Mm -hmm. In response, along with that, we've never experienced it as a 
So to repeat what he just said, so that it's recorded mm -hmm. at the Carroll Library, it's you tell the story, you tell it well. You make sure the administration's got a good story, and they also have data to back that up. And number two, is you tell them you're accounting for everything. I have had to account for every piece of filament that's been printed a couple times, and that is okay, because it won us over in administrative eyes. We can keep doing what we're doing. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Good job. Yeah. So the question is, so it sounds like it's a great student resource now, and, but you touched on it a couple times where faculty are kind of seeing students learning and engaging. Do mm -hmm. you, are you pushing that more? Are they coming to you asking you to do things with their classes? Is there events for them to learn? How does that connection be? For sure. We yeah. need to work more with our idea shop on campus to get that better because they serve the faculty directly. Mm -hmm. The instructional design team needs to start working with, I mean, we have worked together mm -hmm. in one art class. They did four hours worth of training with us, alongside us, partnering, mm -hmm. but there's a whole lot of other ways we can keep growing that and we haven't done. And I have done, um, I did do a workshop <coughs> where I worked with a faculty member in business who um, used 3D printing in his entrepreneurial class and had a really positive experience with it and so he and I worked together on a workshop that we presented to faculty and staff talking about how they could incorporate this incorporate 3d printing just 3d printing into their courses yeah I will also say that the maker lab isn't that old like we've it's only officially been open since September right yeah yeah September. Um, so it's 4.06 right now, so I want to be... Oh, gosh, yeah. We, we're bleeding into your free time. Some of you are on Twitter, though, and I'm happy to continue this conversation. We've got plenty of time. Mm -hmm. We've been following each other, apparently, for a while, as I just noticed. So <laughs> let's keep talking. Thank you, guys, for coming. Thank you.